The Duke of Wellington was born in Ireland on April 29th, 1769. His name then was Arthur Wellesley, and he was the third surviving son of an Irish Earl. This is all that remains now of the Wellesley family seat, Dangan Castle in County Meath. Presumably this was the main entrance. Dangan is now the shell of a splendid 18th century house, and its current owner is farmer Christopher Barry. Something, a couple of pillars perhaps. Possibly, yeah. Um, it is fantastic. It's been the Wellesleys were Anglo-Irish, part of the ruling class which dominated Ireland at this time. Dangan was a Protestant island in a Catholic sea, the family remote from the community around it. And there were lakes there. Mm -hmm. That's right. I think there were two, if not three, lakes, and there was altogether there was a hundred acres underwater. And I think that the the main lake went over in that direction there, over towards those those beech trees. And there were islands in it. There was a cannon on the shore. There were cannon on the shore, and there were models of battleships on the lake. Must have been a fantastic place at the time. It must have been a fantastic view from here, sure. looking out over this this terrific landscape. Yeah. Arthur's father was an earl, but he was also a composer and professor of music at Trinity College Dublin. Arthur himself learned to play the violin rather well. One visit at a dangle memorably described it as a place where there was nothing to do but eat, drink, and enjoy oneself. When Arthur was 12, his world changed abruptly. His father died, leaving nothing but debts. Within a few months, the house and the estates had been rented out. None of the family ever lived here again. Later in life, Arthur Wellesley always resented the suggestion that he was Irish. He famously declared that not everybody born in a stable was a horse. But I think that his family's experience as impoverished Anglo-Irish gentry was what drove him and his brothers. Arthur's eldest brother, the new Earl of Mornington, decided that what little money there was was to be spent on the education of the other brothers. Arthur was considered the least promising. With his future career uncertain, Arthur was taken out of school and sent to a military academy in France to polish his gentlemanly skills. In later years, when Arthur Wellesley looked back on his boyhood, he described himself as a dreamy, shy and idle lad. He was a loner, an odd man out, a Protestant in Ireland, and an Irishman abroad. His mother despaired of him. I vow to God I don't know what I shall do with my awkward son Arthur, she said, and felt he was good for nothing but cannon fodder. At the Academy at Angers, other pupils remembered him mainly for the time he spent playing with his terrier, Vic. But away from the burden of family disappointment, a change came over him. Arthur began to blossom. He himself attributed this to his friendship with the governor's wife, the Marquise de Serron, whom he later described as une dame de la vieille cour. Whatever the cause, by the time Arthur Wellesley left Angers, he now showed a glimmer of promise. 
When his mother caught sight of him, she exclaimed incredulously, That is my ugly boy, Arthur, and wrote that he was a very charming young man. Her left, her left, right, her left. Nonetheless, her left, his family left, could still see no future for him except the army. Most officers' commissions were bought and sold, and Mornington bought him a commission at the lowest officer rank of Ensign, as we would now put it, Second Lieutenant. Arthur had entered an army where officers' promotion was largely dependent on wealth and connections, not ability. The men were volunteers, risking death on a foreign field for meagre wages and two square meals a day. But for now, Britain was at peace. Wellesley received rudimentary training and went back to Ireland as aide to the Lord Lieutenant. He was promoted steadily, but was not a committed soldier. By now, Arthur Wellesley was in his early twenties. He was restless and unfocused, spending more time playing his violin than on his work, and passing his evenings gambling. He was a dilettante but one who was about to learn a lesson at home in Ireland. It was here at Packenall that Arthur was to suffer a grievous blow to his hopes and to his pride. This was the home of a young woman, Kitty Packenham, from a military family of similar standing to the Wellesleys. The Packenhams, however, had married money rather than lost it. Kitty and Arthur had first met when she was only 15. Now, she was 23, and he wanted to marry her. For her part, Kitty was very taken by the young Arthur Wellesley. She was later to say that she'd loved him from the first moment she'd laid eyes upon him, when she was still in the schoolroom. The Packenhams still live at Packenham Hall, though now it is renamed Tullinally Castle. Eliza Packenham is Kitty's great, 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 great niece. What was Kitty like? Well, she was very bookish and very sweet-tempered. She lived a very retired life in Westmeath with her large number of brothers and sisters. She was the second of nine, so she would have been in, in mother role quite early on. Um, I mean, her mother was widowed very young, and so I think she was always helping and very close to her mother as a result. And then I, I expect she sat in this library quite often. Like Arthur, Kitty had lost her father when she was young. Her younger brother, Tom, was head of the family. He was only 21. In this room, Arthur Wellesley asked Kitty's brother, who was actually several years younger than him, for permission to ask her hand in marriage. He was turned down resoundingly. He was a young man of little achievement or position. His prospects were poor. Kitty Packenham could do much better. Arthur was sent packing. Yet again, Arthur Wellesley had been dismissed as not quite up to scratch. The story has it that Arthur went home and threw his violin into the fire. It is certainly true that he never played again. Perhaps it was now that he resolved to make a success of himself. His chance came almost immediately. By 1793, the French revolutionary armies were sweeping across Europe with the British and their allies struggling to contend.
Arthur Wellesley, now Lieutenant Colonel commanding the 33rd Regiment of Foot, was sent to join the troops in the Low Countries. It was one of the most disastrous campaigns of British military history. By the time the 33rd arrived, most of the fighting was over, and the British were in retreat under the command of the Duke of York. By day they marched grimly through the bitter cold of a Dutch winter, making their way towards the port of Bremen. By night, they huddled around whatever fire they could make, and slept on the ground beside frozen rivers. So beat the drum slowly and sound the fife lowly and play the dead march as they carry me along and fire your musket right over my coffin for I'm a young soldier cut down They had few supplies, little food, and inadequate uniforms. Many men were lost, not shot by the French, but killed by cold and disease. It was a bitter experience but one that Arthur Wellesley was to profit from. As he said later, I learnt what one ought not to do, and that is always useful. Soon he would be able to show what he had learnt. The order came when he was 27, in the spring of 1796. He and the regiment were to be sent to India. It was India which would give him the chance to prove himself, to himself, to his family, and to kiss his brother. For nearly a decade, Arthur and Kitty were to be separated, on different continents, forbidden even to write to each other. In later years, their relationship was to be interpreted as a great love story, the reality for both of them was to be rather less romantic. So far, Arthur Wellesley's life had been one of false starts and failed promise. But there was a new opportunity ahead, a chance to make something of himself if he had the courage to grasp it. Gathering together a library, he used the long voyage to India to fill the gaps in his education. Among the military manuals and histories of India, he also read Voltaire, Rousseau and Plutarch, and a rather dubious series called Women of Pleasure. By the time he arrived, he was as well prepared as anybody could be for military success in a completely unfamiliar continent and culture. Now it takes less than 10 hours to fly to India. Then, it took Arthur Wellesley 10 months to sail here. Most of the British arrived at Madras, coming ashore through pounding surf in small boats. Some drowned before they even landed. India was a dangerous and unenviable posting. Some Europeans would return, their fortunes made. But fewer than half the British soldiers who came here would ever see home again. It's such a long way away. I'm struck by the thought of young men from Scunthorpe and Cheltenham coming out here. I feel a long way from home even now with a train and an aircraft relatively close at hand. But just imagine being here with nothing but your feet to get you the next 800 miles perhaps and then a six months voyage home. And it's a long, long way from China. The 
The British had originally come to India for one reason only, trade. India is a prosperous and fertile place, and Europeans had been trading with it for centuries. But by the time that Arthur Wellesley arrived, all this had changed. India was now a place of strategic significance, because the French were here as well. Two European nations were fighting it out for supremacy in the East. The British had control of several key ports and a trading network that stretched across the country, run by the British East India Company. But much of India was under the rule of local leaders, at liberty to play the French off against the British. Wellesley spent his first year in India getting to know parts of the country and training his troops. He was already noted by his superiors for his confidence and quick grasp of the situation. But he was still one, amongst many young British officers, eager to make their name and their fortune. Wellesley's time in India might have proved just as unimpressive as his earlier career, had it not been for one vital event which occurred at the end of his first year. In 1798, his brother, Lord Mornington, was also posted here, but in a rather more important job than Wellesley's. He was to be Governor General of the whole of British India. Wellesley had tremendous respect for his eldest brother, whom as a boy he had considered the most brilliant and wonderful person in the world. Mornington was ambitious far beyond the requirements of his job. The East India Company really wanted to be able to carry on trading in safety. Mornington wanted to make India British. And his younger brother Arthur was to be his most successful instrument in achieving this. Within months of arriving in India, Mornington was making plans to extend British rule, with Arthur as one of his right-hand men. The first task was to establish British control over the rich territory of southern India. Arthur was in charge of a major part of the force, a brigade made up of his own 33rd Regiment, and some East India Company troops, manned by local soldiers known as sepoys. He instituted the same regime of regular drill for these troops as he had for his own regiment. Arthur knew that for the plan to succeed, all the troops must be properly trained and well equipped. But the enemy was formidable. From his splendid fortress of Seringapatam, Tipu Sultan, the Tiger of Mysore, controlled much of southern India. Furthermore, he had a powerful ally in the French, who supplied him with arms and military expertise. Arthur Wellesley, in charge of military preparations, spent months planning the march on Tipu's stronghold. He organized the troops, arranged their supplies, and collected enough siege guns to give them a chance of taking the fortress. Having suffered the results of inefficiency in Flanders, Wellesley was determined to do better now that he was responsible. This was the route that Wellesley and his men took from Madras. It took them five weeks to approach Tipu's stronghold of Seringapatam. By 1799, Wellesley had been in the army for 12 years. But he'd yet to lead his men into a proper battle. All that was about to change. I'm looking for a place called Malavelli. Malavelli is a village on this road, which was useful for a campsite because it had got water. And what the British were planning to do is to get to Malavelli and camp for the night. Well, the British got to Malavelli and were getting ready to make camp when they discovered that across a low plain, and I've not been there, so I'm not quite sure what to expect, across a low plain, there was a ridge. And on the ridge, there were at least two of Tipu's heavy guns and a large part of Tipu's army. It seemed as if Tipu was going to offer battle. This was an advantage from the British point of view because they wanted a battle, because by winning a battle, they could weaken Tipu's force and have a much better chance of taking Surangapata. Mm -hmm. 
As they marched, the British troops had been surrounded by burning fields and under occasional enemy fire. Now it was their chance to retaliate. I'm pretty sure that we're in the position of Tipu's guns. It's actually quite hard to relate contemporary accounts to the map to the ground as it now is. But this, I'm sure, is the ridge that Tipu held, looking down towards the village from which the British were advancing. The British came up that slope in two big columns. The one on this side of the village was commanded by Wellesley, and his regiments came up that slope in columns of their own. They're about halfway up, when a great mass of Tipu's infantry came down from here to meet them. Wellesley swung his regiments into line, and they'd have moved like gates, swinging on a hinge. Tipu's infantry headed for the 33rd, Wellesley's own regiment. And typically, Wellesley was there to give the fire order himself. There was an accurate close-range volley, followed by a charge. As Wellesley himself put it, they did not quite stand to receive the bend. For the first time, Wellesley had led his troops into victory. Tipu was now in retreat, with the British following behind. But Tipu's fortress of Surangapatam, some 30 miles west from Malaveli, was to prove far harder. And on the way, Wellesley was to suffer a grievous blow. On the afternoon of the 5th of April, Wellesley and his men were in camp, just over there, about a mile from the fortress. Then he received orders from General Harris to lead a night attack across the canal, which then had rather less water in it, to the woods just here, held by a party of Tipu's men. He'd only just arrived. His orders were imprecise, and he had no idea of the lie of the land. Wellesley was about to make one of the biggest mistakes of his life. As Wellesley and his men set off into the darkness, they encountered a weapon that they'd never seen before. Wellesley and his troops were in disarray. They didn't know where the enemy was. They didn't know what to do, and they weren't sure where they were going. Even Arthur Wellesley got lost. When he finally stumbled back to the camp, the attack had failed hopelessly, and eight of his men had been taken prisoner. The British had underestimated their enemy. At his splendid court, Tipu Sultan had brought together craftsmen of all kinds and created a vastly improved version of an old weapon, the explosive rocket. There was a core of 5,000 rocket men in Tipu's army. Rodham Narasema is a rocket scientist at the Institute in Bangalore, and he's made a replica of one of Tipu's rockets. And it was carried by individual soldiers. It was carried by individuals. Uh, it could be carried in a kind of a sheath on the back, it could be carried in carts, and it was uh, uh, quite often lodged from those carts, uh, passed around, and uh, they had methods by which, by changing the elevation of the ramp, the angle of the ramp, they could reach different uh, targets. Were they, were they very accurate in reaching these targets? No, they were not very accurate. Uh, so they were most effective and they were fired at groups of soldiers. How far would all these have gone? The, the largest recorded is about two and a half kilometers. And, uh, that's, that's a long way. That's, that's quite long, yes. Thousand yards was very common. They created a lot of confusion and uh, a lot of damage. And I think uh, a lot of it was uh, psychological in the Because I think uh, British troops had not encountered uh, attacks from uh, rockets before. It's certainly a, a reversal of, of, yes. of expectation <coughs> to discover a European army coming out here mm -hmm. and being taken on by something that it doesn't understand and which is a real shock. Yes, yes. 
at midnight that night, whilst they had reported his failure to his commanding officer, General Harris, who recorded that the young colonel had come to his tent in a good deal of agitation. The next day, Wellesley, with more men and proper artillery support, was sent to attack the outpost once again. This time, in daylight, he and his men succeeded. But the bitter humiliation of the previous night taught Wellesley two lessons that he'd never forget. The first was a military lesson of the importance of reconnaissance before attack. The second was an emotional lesson about the bitterness of defeat. All in all, he was lucky to get away with it. Had his brother not been Governor General, Wellesley might have found himself facing a court-martial. But Wellesley had little time to reflect upon these lessons. For the next few weeks, he and his troops were absorbed in playing their part in the siege of the island fortress of Seringapatam. Inside the fort were Tipu Sultan and 30,000 of his men, protected not just by the river, but by a range of defensive walls and moats. Outside, on the other bank of the river, were the British. Their siege guns firing constantly over the heads of their troops, who were entrenched for protection against enemy fire. To defeat Tipu, the British had to knock a breach in the walls, through which they could storm Seringapatam. For three weeks, the British cannon pounded. It was a long, hot, and noisy business. Finally, it was decided that the breach was ripe for attack. Wellesley stayed behind with the reserve, and a fiery Scots general ordered the assault. The attackers, led by a small group of volunteers called the Forlorn Hope, because their chances of survival were so slim, crossed the river just there. Wellesley was watching here on the riverbank and would have been able to see them scramble up the breach. We can see the new stonework where the breach actually was. He'd then have seen how they piled up against a set of inner defences that hadn't been breached. They bravely took a bridge and then there was vicious hand-to-hand -hand fighting for a couple of hours. Finally, Wolsey could see that the fighting was pretty well over. He left his troops here and went across into the fort. Wellesley came up here to the top of the bridge, passing over the bodies of hundreds of attackers and defenders. When he got here, he'd have seen that down in the town, the British army was already badly out of hand, looting and raping. This was the downside of the British soldier across the whole of the period. Phenomenal bravery in a place like this, but a tendency to get into an appalling state, especially after a moment of stress, and if drink was the hand. It was something Wellesley really disapproved of, and he went down into the town to try to stop it. Amidst the splendor of Tipu's fortress, the British soldiers were running amok. Wellesley walked on into the town, trying to assert some sort of control. At the Royal Palace, he posted a guard from his own regiment to protect Tipu's family. But the key question was about Tipu himself. Was he alive or dead? Then Wellesley got a message. There had been fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting here at the Watergate, and this tunnel was choked with dead. The body of a plump, well-dressed man was dragged out. Wellesley felt for a heartbeat. It was Tipu, and he was dead.
The battle was over, and the British had won. Wellesley had played a full part in this victory, but for him the real work was yet to come. The day after the battle, May the 6th, 1799, Arthur Wellesley was put in charge of running the state of Mysore. His first task was to restore order and calm in place of looting and violence. Wellesley took swift action and ordered the worst of the British looters to be hanged. The rest were to be flogged. He was to spend three years governing Mysore. In this time, he was implacable in his opposition to corruptness and deception by British soldiers, even the officers. If we lose our character for truth and good faith, we have but little to stand upon in this country, he wrote. This was the kind of stern sentiment which justified an empire rather than individual profiteering. It was during this time that Wellesley came to recognize his own essentially solitary nature. As he wrote to one of his younger brothers, I like to walk alone. This was to prove both a strength and a weakness. But while Wellesley was absorbed in governing my soul, Mornington was determined not to rest upon his laurels. Within two years, he was planning a new campaign, one which he would ask his brother to lead. To the north of Mysore, the country was run by a loose alliance of rulers, known as the Maratha Confederacy. The Marathas were formidable enemies, with a network of fortified cities stretching far up to the north. In alliance with the French, they could threaten all that Mornington had achieved. He saw his chance when the Marathas began to squabble amongst themselves. But to seize the moment, the British must advance through the monsoon. Moving an army through weather like this was a huge challenge but one that Arthur Wellesley, now promoted to general, welcomed. One of Wellesley's great strengths was his eye for detail. For the advance on the Marathas, he organized a supply of hundreds of coracles like this. The technology has scarcely changed. Then it was buffalo hides, now it's old cement sacks. Some of these were to be carried forward with the troops. Others stockpiled in advance at river crossings. He wanted nothing to hold his army back. Traditionally, the British army abroad foraged off the land, taking food from local people as it marched through. This made it vulnerable to an efficient enemy, burning the crops on its route. Wellesley was determined that his army would take supplies with it. He organized a train of over a hundred thousand bullock carts and enlisted the help of local grain merchants to keep the troops supplied. Even today on the train, the journey takes nearly two days. Then it took months. The roads were atrocious, the bullocks were underfed, and the army kept having to stop to make new wheels. But the troops were fit and well trained, and this time Wellesley was in complete command. I think the single most important thing that Wellesley takes away from India is the importance of logistics. Military historians like me bang on about logistics, but it really means the practical art of moving armies and keeping them supplied. And in this sort of landscape, you really need to understand how to keep troops fed, how to get them across rivers, how to sustain them when they're mounting a siege. And as he takes that away from India with him, and I think it's crucially important.
By mid-August 1803, the British Army had made it here to Aurangabad, 400 miles north of Mysore, close to the heartland of the Maratha Confederacy. Wellesley was about to fight the battle, he was later to describe as his most difficult. On this fertile plain to the north of Aurangabad, the British Army, under Major General Arthur Wellesley, would meet that of the Marathas, and history would be made at the Battle of Assay. There are no markers here, no heritage trail with a panorama explaining the events of nearly 200 years ago. But the battle is not forgotten. My interpreter, Drav Singh, tells me that there's a relic left behind. Uh, there's a cannon actually right next to the temple here. And uh, it would be nice to know that where which part is from. This is, this is the cannon. And it's been in the village uh, ever since it was brought here. And uh, what do you think? Well, I think it, it, it's certainly the British. We've got a mm -hmm. crown here on, on the barrel. And these would have been broken by Wellesley, would they? Well, I, I think it, it, it's, it's heavier, I think, than the ones that Wellesley brought to battle with him. But I can't really tell without looking at the business end of it. You see, it might, it might be a six-pounder. It might be a six-pounder that came in with Wellesley. I simply, I simply don't know. But it is of the right period. It's um, an iron cannon that probably fought at the Battle of Assay. It's a remarkable thing to find. It's still here. And it's found a nice place next to the temple, so yes, it's, it's people are respectful. I mean, it's wonderful to see it. Absolutely wonderful to see it. But that's not all. Some children tell us that there are bits of cannon in a field outside the village. Um, Actual pieces of cannon. Well, that's what they say. We'll just see what it's all about. Oh. What do you make of this? To, to my surprise, I actually think it is a piece of cannon. Really? It, it looks like, well, it's hard to be, to be sure, it looks like part of a pretty heavy gun mm -hmm. um, made of iron. And it, I think it's burst. Iron guns often burst when they got hot. And I think that remarkably, that is a piece of an iron gun. But they were they were notorious when, when they'd been fired a lot. Which they, just burst, that day, they just they would eventually they would eventually burst. Well, they just blew up and just fall into pieces or yeah, well, they, they blew up with, with distressing consequences for the gunners, unfortunately. Right. And we're pretty well where the Maratha guns would have been. They also find uh, metal balls, which I think would be shots. But um, I don't know what they are really. Do you think they're all, all, all the boys have sort of uh, found these, these shots all over the fields. These are canister. This one here. Yeah, these are, they're in iron, not lead. Mm -hmm. So they're not musket balls. And they're different calibers, they're different sizes of, of canister. And these would have come in a tin box. Already. So they have come packed in a tin they box. They come packed in a round tin box, which, which would have been rammed into a cannon. Mm -hmm. And when the cannon was fired, the box broke up. And, and all these would fly out. And, and these would have flown out. Now, I, I can't tell you whether they're um, British or other, but they were absolutely deadly at the time. They were the most deadly sort of projectile fired by artillery. And you, you can imagine these skimming over the battlefield. On the morning of the 23rd of September, Wellesley brought his army just round here. Like Wellesley, I'm going to take to horse to be able to see things better. Now I doubt if this lady looked much like his favourite charger. The men were just making camp when some locals came in with the news that the whole Maratha army was just behind that ridge. For Wellesley, it was a time of decision and risk. He could attack immediately and take them by surprise. Or he could wait a day or two until the whole British force was concentrated. 
Being Wellesley, there was only one decision. He'd attack at once. He was embarking on the hardest battle of his entire career. The first problem facing Wellesley was one of topography. He was on one side of the river, the Marathas on the other. Wellesley wanted to avoid attacking them straight from the front, but instead to attack from a flank, putting them off balance. That meant he must cross the river to the east. But all his guides told him it was too deep to cross. Wellesley wouldn't rest until he'd checked it for himself. One of the reasons why Wellesley didn't believe the guides was that he could see two villages, close together, but on opposite banks of the river. He later wrote that there had to be some habitual means of communication between them. He staked everything on the guides being wrong. Wellesley and his army arrived at the river Caitna to find the water flowing fast. Wellesley was the first man to kick his horse on into the river. But he was right. There was a ford. The water was no more than four feet deep at its worst. Easy for the cavalry and not much of a problem for the infantry. Wellesley led his army across the river. He had succeeded in surprising the Marathas, who hastily regrouped to face him. On the Maratha side of the river, Wellesley formed up his army in line, infantry in front and cavalry behind. Ahead of them, his soldiers could see the skyline filled with the Maratha army. Over a hundred cannon and infantry who outnumbered them by perhaps five to one. It must have been a terrifying sight. The Marathas had already opened fire. The British replied that they were badly outgunned. With cannonballs whistling around him, Wellesley rode from one end of his line to the other, speaking to all his commanding officers personally, and launched the attack. going well. But then came disastrous news. Up here, at the end of the line nearest the fortified village of Assay, the 74th Regiment was being cut to pieces. It had pushed too close to the cannon defending the village, and was then attacked by infantry and cavalry. Its men formed square behind a barrier made up of the bodies of dead enemy. But relief was at hand. A cavalry charge led by the gallant Colonel Maxwell came to the rescue of the 74th and scattered the Marathas. The battle was still not over. Wellesley, who'd already lost two horses, one of them run through with a spear, now rallied his scattered troops and sent them back in tight formation to deal the killing blow. The Marathas broke and fled, leaving all their guns behind them. The Battle of Assay had been won. I can understand now, although frankly I couldn't before, why he reckoned that Assay was his most difficult battle. It's a remarkable achievement to move an army that far over such difficult country, and then to carry out a complicated maneuver in the face of a numerous and determined adversary. Um, it, it's really a tackle-out battle uh, with no safety net, and he does it, he judges it right, and makes it work. Assay was a turning point for the British in India, and a personal triumph for Wellesley as a general. But like all victories, it had a cost. One in four of Wellesley's men had been killed or wounded. The Maratha losses were just as high. It was the bloodiest battle that Wellesley was ever to take part in. At nightfall, the surviving British dropped exhausted 
and slept amongst the ungathered dead. Wellesley for some time was sleepless and sat with his head on his knees. Soon afterwards he was to write, I acknowledge that I should not like again to see such loss, even if accompanied by such a gain. On September the 24th, 1803, the morning after the battle, Arthur Wellesley left Assay and came here to the fortified town of Ajunta, bringing with him the British wounded. Within the secure walls of the town, he organized a field hospital and left a small garrison to protect it. Wellesley and most of his army marched away to the north and over the next few months won another pitched battle and took the key stronghold of Gwalior. There was to be yet more fighting, but the power of the Maratha Confederacy was really broken. For the two years following his victory at Assay, Wellesley returned to rule in Mysore. But by 1805 he'd had enough of India. I have served as long in India, he wrote, as any man ought. However, he had acquired a small fortune and was a knight of the Order of the Bath. Mornington, too, was going home. Between them, the Wellesley brothers had fundamentally changed the status of the British in India. What had started as a matter of commerce was fast becoming an empire. They left behind them an India which, for good or bad, would be under British rule for the next 140 years. In the next few years, Wellesley would become Wellington. His reputation and his fortune would be made, but he still had many hard lessons to learn.